So besides Toy Story being arguably one of the greatest masterpieces of stories ever written, uh, there was a point to that clip, and I will explain it to you, but you'll have to wait a little bit. Um, right now we're going through a series on Joseph, talking about thriving in adversity. And the whole point, the whole focus of this lesson series is that the purpose of God and the plans of God will always prevail. God's purpose and God's plan will always prevail. And it's hard to hear that sometimes, especially when we're in the midst of the thick of it. When we're going through all those hardships, we're just like, okay, God, what are you doing? <laughs> and he's like, just, just wait, I got you. And it's hard to, it, it becomes easy to blame God for the hardship that we go through. The truth is, though, that it's not God's fault. God didn't cause Joseph to be sold into slavery. He didn't force his brothers to sell him there. He didn't force Potiphar's wife to try to sleep with him over and over. He didn't force Joseph to be thrown into prison. But God used those hardships for some amazing things in Joseph's life. He used Joseph's faith and his integrity and his prosperity um, and his perseverance as an example to be shared throughout ages. And he did so much more with him than that. And, and so we'll see some of that in the rest of the series. But right now, we're not there yet. Right now, Joseph is doing one of the hardest things we could ever do. Joseph is waiting. It's hard to wait, isn't it? Take a look at these pictures for just a minute and see if any of them resonate with you. Mm, love that instant gratification in the morning. Mm, I want it now. Uh, you got some, uh, I believe that's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory down there. I'm sure you kids have looked like that before. I'm sure some of you guys have too. Um, I know I have. Um, see, we live in a culture where we want everything now. We want, we want uh, instant oatmeal. We want our food in under 10 minutes or it's free. We want sex before marriage. We want the car before we have the money. We want uh, the, you know, everything now, but the problem is that right now is rarely ever the time. Because when we try to make right now the time, we oftentimes end up missing out on what God has planned for us, and we end up making mistakes. Think about Abraham and Sarah. Uh, Abraham and Sarah were promised by God that they would have a child, and that their descendants, their generations, would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the she seashore, and they're like 90-something years old. And they're like, all right, God, <laughs> when's this going to happen? And it's still, it, they're, they're waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, they're just like, all right, we're done waiting. We're just going to take things into our own hands. And so uh, they give birth to Ishmael. But the problem is that Ishmael wasn't the child of promise. And that caused some problems throughout history, including the fact that the Ishmaelites were the ones that, that bought Joseph and sold him into slavery. Every sin in this world stems from trying to take control from God and to make it our own and to, and to ignore what he's trying to do in his timing rather than trusting him. When what we simply need to do is have faith and wait. The amazing thing about Joseph is that he, he doesn't try to rush God's plans. He knows that, uh, an important, that waiting is an important part of life. Uh, we're in G Genesis chapter 40 today. If you guys want to turn there, or go to your version apps or whatever. Um, we're in Genesis chapter 40. And last week, Derek talked about how Joseph learned to thrive in adversity. Uh, and, and so Joseph is in prison right now. And it said that the keeper of the prison put Joseph over the entire uh, household where, where, uh, where the prison was. And that, that anything that Joseph did, the Lord made it succeed. And that the, the prison keeper didn't have to worry about any of the day to day responsibilities. And so we pick up today in Genesis chapter 40, and it says, Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their, the Lord their king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them, and they continued for some time in custody. When we face adverse situations, there's often three responses, and you guys have heard this many times in your life. You can fight, you can f uh, flee, or you can f uh, freeze. Fight, flight, or freeze. Those are the typical responses when we face hardship. 
Uh, the thing is that when it's time for the waiting room of our future to open, for, the, for that door to open, it's God who will open it for us, not us. When we freeze up or, or try to run away from it, uh, we end up missing when that door opens. Or if you try to break it down like, like Mission Impossible or something, like you end up making a mistake, and, and while you can't mess up the plans and purpose of God, you still end up missing out on what he's trying to do, which is better than what we can do. Um... For several months after I, I, I finished college, I was in a period of waiting, and it was horrible. Uh, I went back, and I, now, I love my family, so don't you dare hear me say that I don't love my family. When they come to visit next week or the week after, don't you dare tell them that I say I didn't enjoy my time with them. But when you're in college and living out on your own, and then you have to go back and live with your, your parents again and be on their time schedule, it gets hard. And so I was sitting there, I was applying, I applied for dozens and dozens of different youth ministry positions, and I was waiting for God to open the door. And it was about six months before he finally opened a door, uh, not for a youth ministry position, which was what I was looking for, that's what my degree was in, um, but it was for going back to this camp that I had been at. And it was through being there at that camp again, and through, through doing another uh, nine month or so internship after that, that God really started to show me that there was a lot more in my life that had to be worked out before I was ready for the position I got here. I wasn't ready. And so that, that time was important. And Joseph, he doesn't try to flee. He doesn't try to fight what God's doing, and he doesn't freeze up. He presses on because he knows that he's learning an invaluable lesson right here about waiting. Waiting, God uses waiting to prepare us. He uses that waiting to prepare us. And Joseph waits, but it's, it's more than that because waiting sounds like you're just kind of sitting there like, all right, what's next? And, and, and that's not what Joseph does. No, he's active in his waiting. He still works hard. He still serves others. He still takes care of people, even prisoners. He's showing the love of God. Because uh, it's through his remaining of faithfulness that he ended up becoming the head of Potiphar's household, and then the head of the prison, and then eventually the head of the nation. But again, we're not there yet. And so we continue on in Genesis chapter 40, verse 5. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker and the ki uh, of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Joseph, uh, the Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are you downcast today? They said to him, we've had dreams and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream there was a vine before me and, the vine, uh, and on the vine were three branches. And as soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took, I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to them, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to his office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup into his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me. When, you, uh, when it goes well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh and so get me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews and here also I have done nothing that they should throw me into the pit. I wanted us to take notice some, of something right here. Just because Joseph wasn't fighting God's plan doesn't mean he still didn't long for his freedom. I mean, you can almost hear after all these years of being in slavery and being in prison and stuff, you can almost hear his heart cry out, God, you made this promise to me. You promised that I would be a leader among my people. And, and, and I, I know that this works into your plan and I don't know how, but I'm ready for it to be true. I'm re I long for my freedom. I miss, I miss my family. I miss my home. I'm ready for what's next. This time of waiting begins to give uh, Joseph clarity in what God's plan is. And if he had done the fight, flight, or freeze, he would have missed out on the interpretations of this dream. You see, this dream, this is where Joseph gets to tell the cupbearer what's going on. And later on, it's the cupbearer who tells uh, Pharaoh about Joseph's interpretations. And that's how he ends up getting free. And if, he, if Joseph had tried to fight off what God, is, God was doing, he wouldn't have been in the midst of that prison to listen to the cupbearer. 
and to help him through his hardships. Actively waiting prepared Joseph for the fulfillment of God's purpose and plan. Uh, there was uh, a fun fact about my family. Uh, we have, um, well, about 12 years ago, there were six of us uh, in a 900 square foot house living there. Uh, so it was my parents and my, my two younger siblings, and then my dad and my grandpa turned the upstairs into a, a bedroom. It was an attic that they turned into a bedroom. And so there were six of us. My parents were beginning to pay off the house, and we were about to start taking vacations, and, and we were in a good spot. And my parents had planned on not having any more kids. They took precautions. And, and so my dad, six years after they took the precautions, uh, my dad goes to the doctor, and he's like, nope, you shouldn't be having any more kids. You're good to go. And within a week or two, my mom finds out that she's pregnant. And then, in that same time period, there's this freshman boy that's going through hardships in his life, and he ends up coming to live with us through his high school years. And so now, there's going to be eight people in a 900-square-foot house. And so my parents started looking for a new house. And it took two years for us to find a new place. Now, there was one place we kept putting in the offer over and over, and it wasn't working out. Uh, and th that was really the one that my parents wanted because it was in a good neighborhood. Um, it was right next door to my brother's best friend. Uh, and that actually ended up being the one that my parents got with the roof replaced and at a lower price than what they originally offered. But it took two years to get to that point. But my parents persisted in their faith. They continued pursuing after God, and they continued trusting him. And rather than freezing up, they, they, they pressed on. And because of that... If they hadn't done that, we wouldn't have had room, uh, not just for our family and the boy that came to live with us, but for another mom and her son to live with us for about a year while they were facing some hardship. We wouldn't have had room for the foreign exchange students that came into our home and that my parents have gotten the opportunity to pour into their lives. We wouldn't have had room for the small groups that we had in our house or for the many other times that we had people over and helped take care of people. And if, if, they had done, if they hadn't trusted in God, they would have missed out on the blessing of what he was trying to do. Um, here's another fun fact. About 2,000 years ago, when Jesus walked to this earth, he spent 30 years waiting for three years of ministry. He spent 10 times as long of a waiting period learning and growing and, and, and trusting in God for three years of ministry. And even during his ministry, he would spend time and he would withdraw from society so that he would have time to wait and pray and trust in God. Even the night before he was thrown into a prison, even the night before he was arrested, he spent that night praying and trusting and waiting on God so that he would be prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice in this world. And because of that, there is no greater person that's been before or since then that's had a greater impact on this world than Jesus Christ. There is no salvation without him. There is no relationship with the Heavenly Father without him. And he waited. The lives of Joseph and Jesus show us that if we want to be used by God, we have to learn to wait. We have to learn to trust his timing. And he never said that this would be easy. But he promised that he would bless us and that he would be with us throughout the entire process as he writes this most incredible story of history. Uh, the Apostle Peter tells us that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Even God waits. He says if, if, it's, if you, it means even the difference of one person coming to repentance and having eternal, an eternal relationship with me, I'll wait for Jesus to come back because that one person is worth it to me. I love them and I value them. So let's finish our text. Uh, Genesis 40, 16, we continue on. When uh, the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cakes of basket on my, three cake baskets on my head, sorry. And the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked foods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days, and in three days, Pharaoh will lift your head up from you. 
and hang you from a tree, and the birds will eat flesh from you. Now, wouldn't you love to be Joseph right here? He comes into the cell, and he's like, hey, guys, how's this going? Good, good morning, good morning. Oh, what's, what's troubling you? Oh, your dream, your dream means you're going to be, be uh, successful. Joseph, uh, I'm sorry, Pharaoh's going to restore you back to, to where you were. And by the way, if you could please help me out. Oh, you're going to die. Here's breakfast. Have a nice day. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. So on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and of the head of the chief, uh, of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Man, what a way to end today's story. So great. Uh, it's like Finding Nemo, uh, Dory and Marlin are just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And Joseph's just keep swimming right on through the darkness. And, and finally, this little glimmer of hope, this light. And, 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 but then, happy feeling gone. But in the midst of that little brightness, in that brief moment of light, a seed was planted. And we find the second thing that waiting does. Waiting builds anticipation for the purpose of, and plan of God to be fulfilled. Waiting builds anticipation for the purpose and plan of God to be fulfilled. The hardest part of waiting is that longing, that, that deep desire that grows in you for whatever it is to happen. Uh, many of you guys have family that lives outside of the state. If you get to see your family all the time, it's wonderful. But if it's once a month, or once a quarter, or once a year, then when you're finally getting to drive back to wherever they are and you pull into that driveway and you open the door and you see them with the biggest smile on their face and you finally get to embrace one another, it makes it that much sweeter. Or many of you right now probably aren't enjoying work. Everybody has times in their lives where work is hard and you're just like, oh, I'm just ready for retirement. I'm just ready for this to end. I'm ready for the next phase of life. Ready to find a new job, whatever. It happens. But think about that time when you're like planning a vacation. It's just this big vacation. And you're like, oh, finally, some reprieve. And so you plan it probably like four months out and you're like, all right. And you start making preparations for it, but you're still going through the hardship of work. And so you're putting aside every penny you have and you're, finally, you're starting to look for deals on where to stay and what to do. And so when you finally get to that four months later, even, even through all the hardship of work, and you go and you get to where you're going, It makes it so much more worth it. God has a plan to use each and every one of us. And when we think about it, uh, we, we don't really get the choice in whether or not we wait. We want the choice in whether or not we wait, but we don't get to choose. The anticipation, though, that builds is what makes it greater. Uh, Paul told the people of Rome in Romans chapter 8, we've heard this a few times in the last year, but it's such a good passage. It says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we, await, uh, as we eagerly await for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now who hopes in what it, uh, now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Just as Joseph longed for the day of his redemption, just as we, uh, we, we too long for the day of Christ's return, even all of creation is groaning and longing for Jesus to return. Our very heart, our souls cry out. Every time we cry for mercy, every time we cry for justice, every time we cry for hope, every time, it's not, it's, you're a little early. <laughs> every time we cry for hope, every time for, we cry for justice, uh, we, uh, our, our souls cry out for it. We long for the day of our redemption. And even if you don't have that in you, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ yet, 
I guarantee you there's a longing within you for something more. And if it's not there, it's probably because you've fought it or run from it or frozen up against it. And, and I promise you, if you want it again, God can stir that back up within you. God has a plan to use each and every one of us. He longs to use us so that we, and he longs to give us an eternal relationship with him. And it's not just because he doesn't want us to suffer the eternity of hell. It's because he loves us. And he wants to take the, the, even the mistakes that we make and turn them into an, an incredible story. Uh, you're gonna hear in a few weeks um, how Joseph was used literally to save not just uh, the people of Israel, but really, if you think about it, uh, it's because he saved the people of Israel that, that Jesus was born because Israel would not have continued on had, not, had it not been for Joseph. They would have died from famine. And, and we're still waiting we're still waiting and wondering when God's promise will come true. Joseph is still waiting and wondering when God's promise is gonna come true. But until that time, we can't just wait idly. We have to prepare ourselves and prepare this world. As somebody who loves art, uh, that clip that I showed at the beginning, uh, that's one of my, my favorite scenes, and God uses that a lot of times to minister to me, as weird as that sounds. Uh, that scene, along with Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul tells the people, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will see it through, uh, will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. God promised a future hope to his people, but that day isn't here yet. The God of this universe, with whom there is no shadow of change, has made a promise to us, and he cannot lie. But as the wise elderly man said, you can't rush art. If you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, this is one instance where I would say, don't wait. We're going to have a baptism today. Those waters are ready. If you're ready to give your life to Jesus, man, don't wait. Because God wants to begin that work within you today as you wait for his return. And if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, don't run from God's plan. Don't fight it. Don't try to freeze up against it. Don't try to rush it. God is writing this most incredible story throughout history. He's, he's painting a mural on the walls of time. He's plucking the chords of our lives in this perfect symphony. And if we try to rush it, we're only going to make mistakes. And we're going to miss out on the blessing of, of what he's doing. We can't rush the art of God. And we must learn to wait because waiting, waiting prepares us. And waiting builds anticipation for the day of God's purpose and plan to be fulfilled. I'm going to pray and then we're, I'm, I'm going to come down here. If you have a decision that you need to make, uh, feel free. God, I, I lift up to you these people, Father. We are waiting. So many times I'm just like, God, I'm ready for you to come back. This world can be pretty crappy. And yet, God, you're doing some incredible things in this world, even in the midst of the hardship. Father, would you turn our eyes to that beauty? Would you help us to trust in you? Would you help us to learn to wait? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand and sing.